Okay, Jesse, welcome to the Entrepreneur Next Door podcast. Um, as I said to you before I hit the record button, I'm not in my usual office with all my usual technology and multiple screens, but we're going to do this anyway. Um, I, I want to make a, a really quick intro. And, and the intro is that most of the people that appear on my podcast are entrepreneurs and they all have stories about business. And we, we tend to get sucked into labeling things and categorizing things in life. And we tend to forget that behind each one of those labels or categories or cliche, there's a living, breathing human being, right? Um, and so while the, the, the stories are about entrepreneurship and we'll get to yours, it's, it's really mostly about the human aspect, like everybody's stories, how they got to where they got their childhood, etc. So with that in mind, um, we'll talk about your, what you do for a living, but let's start with, I'm not asking you to introduce yourself on, on purpose. <laughs> let's start with January 18th, 2015. Where's Jesse on that day? Go. Um, January 18th, 2015, I woke up that morning, went and rode my dirt bike, had an incredible day um, out in the woods. I One of my favorite places is always in nature, in the woods. Um, and then that evening, went out with a friend, went to dinner, rode his motorcycle. Uh, we left dinner and went towards Charlotte for our regular little loop that we would take. And we didn't make it very far because a woman made a U-turn in front of us and he didn't stop in time. So he went through the back window of her car, breaking his leg. I went over her SUV. I broke my back in two places. My chest completely collapsed. My ribs punctured my lungs, nicking my spinal cord. I have a traumatic brain injury and I coded twice and had to be resuscitated. So I'm very lucky to be a paraplegic out of that and not be the worst from it. Okay, and you're still talking about it with a big smile on your face, which is why you're on this podcast. So, um, yeah, do you do you remember the moment of impact? I, I, I don't mean to be morbid, but it's important. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I remember the last thing I remember was I was hitting him because he wasn't slowing down. That woman wasn't slowing down. So I just closed my eyes and I tucked into his back. And the last thing I remember is everything going black. And then at some point I saw my own grandmother and she told me, Jesse May, it's not your time. I can't stay with you. You can't stay with me, but you have things to do and people to get back to. And she sent me back to this world to come in and do God's work and, and live a bigger purpose than I could have ever imagined. So, so for people who are, I don't know if you need to be an atheist or anything else who would listen to you know, that moment of, you know, the bright light before you supposedly die. And in your case, it's real. somebody close to you shows up and says, it's not your time, so go back, right? Uh, it, it's real, right? I mean, for, for those of us who've never gone through it, uh, it, it still sounds very surreal. It but... definitely is. I mean, I was an atheist up until the day before my accident. So I believed in nothing. I was like, you die, that's it. There's no higher power. We're just here at our own demise. And I went to a friend's grandmother's funeral who I was really close with his grandmother. Uh, she was like my adult grandmother. And so as the pastor was speaking, I felt calmness coming over me. And I'm like, wow, everything's gonna be okay. And I thought it was with granny's passing, but I didn't realize the next day I was gonna see my own grandmother and, and have this crazy traumatic experience um that completely changed the trajectory of my life i'm currently writing my book and it's very interesting how many times the higher power tried to stop me and redirect me and i just kept going down the path of destruction and this accident i tried to go down the path of destruction for about the first year after my injury and i kept getting infections kept getting sick and i was like wow jesse like your body's not the same you've got to change something and that was my come to Jesus moment, for lack of better words, of I need to be different. I need to change my mindset. I need to change my physical being and really be a better human. So so I, I guess I have a question 
um, you, you said come to Jesus moment. Is it when you talk about this? Is it a, is it is it about Jesus or let's call it God or is it just a higher power that's directing you that you connect it with? I don't want to label it like I personally pray to God. I believe in God, right? And but everyone there's a higher power. There's something bigger orchestrating this thing. And when you pay attention to the way the world works and the way things happen, you're like, holy crap, especially in your own life, you see it, you see it working, you see how it works. So like for me, it was, I gave my life to the higher power. I gave my life to God. And I said, I don't know what my purpose is, but I need you to show me. I need you to guide me and I need some direction. And that's when, when things really started to open up for me. And I was like, oh, I, I want to be a nutrition coach. And I want to launch this fitness app for wheelchair users. And I want to make a bigger impact and help people become more independent. And I'm like, I actually wanted to serve people. And that's kind of where my mindset changed whenever I did actually give my life to a higher power. So, so let's go back to whatever number of days after you, you code twice. You, I saw pictures of you in a hospital with all the equipment. Um, at some point, someone comes to you and says, or oh, maybe you discovered yourself that you don't have any feelings in your legs, right? The, who, who delivered the bad news to you? And do you remember your thoughts at the moment? I woke up to a nurse between my legs, tapping me. And I couldn't feel her and I panicked. <laughs> I was like, what are you doing? Why can't I feel you? And she's like, oh, I'm draining your bladder. And then I said, well, why can't I just go to the toilet? And she said, oh, sweetie, you have a spinal cord injury. And I'm like, but yeah, why can't I still use the toilet? I didn't understand that paralysis, spinal cord injury, it meant more than just not walking just not feeling like when when I heard oh that person's paralyzed I'm like oh they just can't walk I didn't realize that you lose all sensation but you still feel pain that you don't have bowel and bladder control and you have to use medical devices to help with those things um mm -hmm. it definitely it was very just the world kind of closed down around you right and you're like holy crap what did I just get myself into <laughs> so um, I, I guess you spent three months in the hospital, if I remember correctly, right? Roughly, yeah. Uh, and, and, and in one of, and, and I tend to prepare for these, so I watch your talks and read your stuff. Um, at some point, you said, reality doesn't hit you until you go home. Yeah. Right? Um, talk about that. So... Very interesting. I, I actually moved back to my parents' house to a year before I got injured. Um, they bought the house that we currently live in two years before I was paralyzed. The entire basement was set up for a wheelchair user. It had a roll-in shower, bars beside the toilet, everything. And so it's like I was set up to live this life from the beginning. But it's still, when you go home, after something traumatic, after a big change, whether it's loss of a loved one or a sickness or illness or, or physical change in your body, right? It's not the same space. And it's a little bit mm -hmm. of an initial shock. Um, my parents' house is three stories. So I have an outdoor lift to get up and down because I, I rent the basement from them. And so it's like all the accessibility needs were in the basement. So I got home and it wasn't finished yet. I didn't have the lift yet. I was sleeping on the living in the living room on an air mattress. Um, I had to learn how to manage my bowel and bladder with day to day life. Because if you don't manage it, you just go on yourself. And it's like, well, that's no way to live life, right? You want to be able to manage those things. And so it's, it's a shock. You expect to go home and the space be the same as you left it. And it's not because you're not the same. And so it took a lot of self-reflection. My first year, I definitely numbed. I numbed the pain with, with alcohol and, and things. And I just kept on trying to party and live that life. But after I got through the party phase, I stopped. And it made me become more aware of myself, what I had control of. And, and I, that's what I began to focus on. And that's why I shared on my platform, I'm like, we only have control of what we have control of in life. We can't control the way other people perceive us. I can't control the lower half of my body. So why am I going to let these things 
out of my control control me and control mm -hmm. my happiness. So um, I think about a month ago, what well, actually in August, um, I shared something personal on LinkedIn, which was two years ago, I had a surprise uh, bypass surgery as, as a very fit guy with no symptoms. It's one of these things they call, you know, the widow maker. So my, my LAD artery was 98% block unbeknownst to me. So I was just actually very lucky that that all I felt was weird. My blood pressure spiked and I wind up in a great hospital in New York City, Lenox Hill, and where my daughter is an ER nurse. So, but, but the point is, um, I remember uh, every night when everybody left, you're just sitting, you're laying there on your bed, hooked up to, you know, IVs in my case, uh, and heart monitor, and you know, the oxygen pulse meter, whatever they call it. And there's the constant beeping and noise and, but you, you, you're there by yourself in, uh, on a hospital bed in a gown with all these instruments. I couldn't sleep because the noise was driving me crazy. Um, and then I think reality kind of hits you, right? Holy crap. I'm in the hospital. Uh, in my case, nothing compared to, to you, but when, when the nurse, you know, put the catheter in you and then at some point you're, you're at some point you're, you're alone a lot in the hospital. They, they come in and out and maybe your family there. Um, that's when the thoughts, that's when reality hits, right? It definitely. So I've had, um, I've had three back surgeries now since this has happened to me. And I will say that first hospital stay, I dove into Facebook support groups. I was constantly, if I was awake, I was on my phone scouring the internet. I'm like, how is my life going to look? What can I still do? I, I was active. I love to just adventure and be wild. And I was like, how can I still do this from this wheelchair? Whereas my most recent, I just had a spinal fusion back in August. And when I was alone in the hospital, then I journaled and I thought about myself and where I'm at and how I got here. And it's like, when life happens and we go through things, we grow and we develop through it. Ideally, that is that is the ideal experience of, of having trauma. Some people, they stay in that trauma and they, they remain a victim for life. And that's what I'm that's what my work serves is to pull people out of victimization. But when you are able to address it, work through it and then gain more understanding of self, what led you there? how you got into the situation, how you perceive the people around you, how the people around you perceive you. When you start to address all of these things, it's a different, it's a different loneliness. You enjoy that loneliness. Mm -hmm. You enjoy that quiet time where when the first round in the hospital, I was doing everything to drown out those dark thoughts by getting online and seeing like, okay, what can I still do? Because had I not been on my phone, hundred percent, I would have went to, to darkness and, I would have been like, oh my gosh, my life is over. I can't do anything. And I did have those moments where I catastrophized for a hot second. And I was like, I can't, I, all I could see is everything I couldn't do. And by getting in those support groups, I was like, what can I still do? And people were posting like mountain biking and water skiing and having families and working full time. And you're like, oh, wheelchair users are literally people too. Okay, cool. I could, I could live life. I don't have to be a victim of my reality. And that's what gave me hope. I think the biggest thing the hospital kind of takes from people is hope. Yeah, it, it's interesting. One of my my clients years ago, because I spent many years in the medical device industry, this company called Medtronic. Yeah. Um, it's not a commercial for them, but if you actually, I, I always thought that was a brilliant logo. If you look at the Medtronic logo, uh, it actually shows a body in a horizontal position and then slowly going towards a standing position, right? And that's the concept behind Medtronic and their devices and everything they do is to, to get you from lying in a stupid, uncomfortable hospital bed <laughs> to being fully functional and be able to, to, to live, right? Which is something you're doing. Um, I'm an old timer and I always was told you never ask a, a woman and especially a beautiful woman how old she is, but I'm gonna break it so how old were you in 2018 when this happened? In, 20, in 2015 when it happened? 2015, I, I'm sorry, yeah. It was 22. Um, so I'm 31 now. 
So you're just you're just a kid. You're a baby. Yeah, yeah, wild and, kid. And, and, and out of control. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I was gonna say, looking at your pictures, looking at things you've done, you definitely lived life, and you were pretty wild. Yeah. Um, so, so the stuff that we're talking about in in, I guess, in motivational speak is is you know fighting the voices inside your head, but in your case, because you're so fiercely competitive. Life for you, it's you're really competing with yourself all the time, isn't it? Like me versus right? me. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, that's I, how I, I think I think we get too caught up in, in competing with others and we've got to be better than this person and do that. And I'm like, no, no, it's me versus me. Like I I'm in a, a niche space, right? Like I'm in a wheelchair fitness space, which I I have one on one clients that are non disabled as well, but primarily my my fitness app my business focuses on wheelchair users and there's another woman in the space doing it at the capacity I'm doing it. And I'm like, we're not competing girl. We're going to collab. We're in a niche space. So now we have, we've branded together and she's actually converted her information into the fitness app. She's going to be sharing workouts there. And we decided to merge our brands together to serve the community at a wider range. Because some people like her, some people like her. We're two different, very different personalities. So it just made sense. And it's like if more people stop focusing on competing against one another and focus on collaborating with one another for the greater good and the bigger mission, the whole world would probably be a little bit better of a space, you know? <laughs> so th this is uh, the, the other quote that I wrote down that you said is, you learn what matters in life, right? which is sort of like what we just touched on, right? If we actually collaborate with people and, and go beyond what's in front of us, right? And for, for all of us, anybody that's listening to this and watching us, uh, including myself, because you're so, uh, you're so impressive, um, our definition, and I'm saying our is in somebody who's now wheelchair bound, our definition of a bad day is a joke, right? It's literally a joke. Um, you know, interestingly, um, I grew up in Israel, and because, uh, well, somebody's here just deciding to walk into where I am and be loud. Um, so in Israel, because we're a small country and, and it was always engaging in war, there's a very, very large population of wounded soldiers. Many of them are, are handicapped. Many of them are in wheelchairs. Many of them have no limbs. It's, it's pretty brutal. But the country, uh, unlike the U.S., uh, if you're a wounded vet, the world is yours. Everything is given to them, from specially equipped cars to retrofitting apartments. To anything you need, technology, is given to somebody who's sacrificed for the country. Uh, so if you, when you have a chance, if you look at Look at Israel and, and how people that are, I mean, this is the first time I've ever seen wheelchair bound tennis players play. And, and it was, this is years ago. This is not something new. The, the level of play and competitiveness and speed is mind boggling. My, right. They could probably beat me if I was playing, right? So, um, just wait until we get in on pickleball. We already are, or we're coming for you. There you go. Okay, you touched you touched something that I do and I love, so that's fine. And you know that about me. Um, so, be, before we get into your entrepreneurship and how you you were able to get beyond that, um, the world is not short of motivational speakers, right? There's plenty, plenty of them everywhere, <clears throat> and. Um, one of the things that that and I've had, I've had my share of attending and listening and continue to do this. I have my own people that I pick and stay with. Um, but there's there's a phenomenon that happens when you go to you listen you, you watch a motivational speaker or you go to an event. There's a there's a level of energy that that builds up in you. But then when you leave the event. It goes out the window. It's just human nature, right? You get excited, you commit to doing whatever the person told you you should be doing, and maybe you try it once, you try it twice, then you get sucked into your routine, and it's over until the next time, right? How do you stay so up and motivated, right? I mean, you're in a wheelchair. 
this is this is part of life. It's not like you can you can't live in a denial and say I'm not in a wheelchair. That doesn't work. I can live in denial and say bad things didn't happen to me and suppress them. Fine. You're not in that world. How do you stay motivated? You have bad days just like the rest of us, but your bad days are probably different than ours. There, honestly, I don't recognize my wheelchair until my wheelchair forces me to recognize it. It's not the first thing I identify myself as. I don't say, hi, I'm Jesse Strawham, a wheelchair user. I'm hi. I'm Jesse Strawham. I'm the owner of the Wheel With Me organizations. Like, I'm, I'm not my wheelchair. I'm not my disability. And when that mindset shifted for me, it allowed me to see beyond my quote-unquote limitations, right? Uh, society will limit us by the way they perceive us, regardless of who we are, um, regardless of where we're at, whether it's for your skin color, your age, your mobility, society will always have judgments. And when I stopped doing things for other people and started doing things for self, I was able to change myself. Um, one of my favorite speakers is Ed Milet. And in his book, The Power of One More, he talks about how we have this thermostat. And like, think about the thermostat in your house, right? If it's set at 70, the temperature will go up, but it will always go back to 70. And so unless we raise our thermostat to say, no, I function at 80% most of the time. And I function this way. Like you have to raise who you are and, and change who you are and change your habits in order not to go back into those old routines. And so it just started with one habit at a time. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna wake up at 6 a.m. and I'm gonna read before I touch my phone. And then that turned into me leaving my phone into the bathroom overnight. So now I'm going to read and I'm going to read scripture too. What else am I going to do? Oh, I'm going to add meditation. And so it wasn't just like one day I woke up and I had it, but it was something I practiced and continue to practice year after year to continue to get better at being disciplined because motivation is bullshit. It's not real. It, it's something that it goes out the window and, it can be built, it can be given to us, like when we go to these events and we have all that energy and that motivation, but you have to, you have to create discipline in your life to maintain any motivation to get to where you are. And that discipline comes after you find purpose. And so you look at it as layers rather than I need to get to point B now. Hmm. So, you know, just to, as, as you talk, I'm talking about, I'm thinking about motivation and the stuff that I've seen you do. There was one event where you're on stage uh, and right before you speak and they introduce you, there's a guy off to your left who's offering you a chair and you just looked at him and you said, oh no, I, I have a chair, thank you. I thought that was hysterical. Um, but you said, you said something uh, profound, which for me defined businesses and now we can get into your entrepreneurship. You said um, you, you have to focus and discover and hone in on your purpose, right? And for me, the, the best businesses that that I engage with, the worst businesses that I know of are, yes, they solve a problem. Yes, they solve a problem and they wanna make money, but there's a higher purpose to their existence. And it's genuine, it's not, you know, bullshit mission, vision, blah, 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 that, that they don't live by. And, there's, and by the way, those are the exceptions, not the rule, right? So, I'll just make up a number because I don't have I don't have any way to justify it. But if you'd say that 90% of businesses have mission, visions, and marketing slogans, and most of it is BS. It's just because it sounds good and it's cute and maybe people will like it, whatever. Fine. They still are in business and many of them make money, whatever. But the exceptional companies, the ones that are truly have a purpose, um, other ones that that are able to survive and resonate and continue to grow. So for you, uh, and, and by the way, I I, I want to skip over the the years and the agonizing process of rehabilitation <laughs> that you went through because I don't think we need to. It's it's obvious that you went through hell to get to where you are today. And I want to stay with this beautiful smile that you have and talk about the present and the future. So when. When was the time when you decided to be a business person? Um, so honestly, my business was started by somebody I was in a relationship with uh, to get money into an account where the government wouldn't take away my monthly disability check when I spoke because I was just speaking at the time. 
obviously I had a story to tell. I'd done Tough Mudders. I was an athlete. And so it was a, a place for my speaking money to go. Well, then I was like, oh, maybe I should start coaching when the pandemic hit. So that's wait, wait, wait. Is this, uh, is this the dude in the Tough Mudder that's pulling you up when you needed to be pulled up? No, no, no. Is he with you? Was that a different guy? No, no. This was, um, this okay. was I had like a long, I had a two-year relationship with them and um, he just wanted to help me grow. He's the reason I went back and finished my college degree. So I have an associate's degree. Like I wouldn't have done that had I not had him pushing me. So I'm very grateful for the purpose he served at the time he served mm-hmm. it. Um, and one of those things was starting my business. So he, he got real with me consulting LLC. Um, he started that for me and then it kind of pushed me into being like, well, I have this business. What more can I do with it besides speaking? Especially when the pandemic hit, it was like, all right, how can I coach? How can I serve? And then it just, it really started to kind of waterfall. I got introduced to a supplement company that changed my life, uh, changed the way I look at food. And then from there, I got connected with an app developer and he's like, I want you to be the first one to have a fitness app for wheelchair users, by wheelchair users. And I was like, cool. So we launched the fitness app. Um, and then it just, it's con- continuously waterfalled to where now I have an actual partner and we're building a 12 week course for people to overcome their trauma and to move on from it. We primarily serve wheelchair users, but we, everyone has trauma. Everyone has things to learn from. And if we can inspire somebody to do a little more with their life, come on in, come join mm-hmm. us. Let us help you. That's the biggest thing. So I, I don't remember who did this, but if, I think it was an actor. Uh, who were who was going to play a role of somebody who's blind in a movie and he wanted to experience what it's like to be blind and so for I think a week um, they put stuff on his eye and he actually lived on the streets as a blind person to truly experience it because I mean actors can can put themselves into their character but this is physical limitations right so um, you're talking to somebody who's walking perfectly fine who has no concept of of what it's like to be in a wheelchair. And it's probably a good exercise for some of us to experience it and actually go and try and live in a wheelchair. Um, so, so it's interesting. I had another observation as I was preparing to talk to you. Um, I kind of wrote it down and I said, you know, Jess, um, I knew I was gonna talk to you and I know you, you're in a wheelchair and I know you're doing amazing stuff. And then I started to think and I said, you know, when was the last time that I've actually seen somebody in a wheelchair other than nursing homes and other than hospitals, like on a day to day stuff, wherever, wherever you go. And I said, Holy crap. I don't even remember. So, and, and they're not. So my question is, where are you? I mean, where's everybody? Um, right? It's pretty, it's pretty interesting. I mean, I know it's, there's a phenomenon, you know, when, you, when you're when mm-hmm. looking to buy a car and you decide to buy a Toyota and you start doing the research, all of a sudden, every car you see in a road is a Toyota. It's, it's actually a known psychological phenomenon. Maybe it'll happen with, with wheelchair-bound people, but honestly, I don't see that. Because we don't have equal access to the world. Over 50% of our country is inaccessible. That's pu- public transit. Like, I live out 40 minutes from Charlotte. There's not much public transit here. They'll only take you to doctor's appointments outside of that. If you don't drive, if you don't have your own car, if you're not doing your own thing, no one's going to see you. The reason we're not seen is because we don't have equal access to be seen. The ADA was passed 30 years ago, and it's outdated. Universal design is something that needs to be implemented on the ADA. If there's a new building, it needs to be built with universal design where you don't see the accessibility, but it adds accessibility. If we think about New York City, when you go out, look at every building that has an entrance with stairs. <laughs> like, yeah, most buildings have stairs. And so if if I live in New York City, I get a spinal cord injury. My loft or where I'm staying has stairs. How often am I going to get out of that loft? I have someone to carry me in, but not get me out. So it, it's there's complete lack of access from residential to commercial in the United in the world in general, but in the United States. So that's why. So, we- so I, I have a lot of um, uh, international viewers and listeners to my podcast, and and I always stop and we talk about terminology because I want to educate them about. Uh, 
what happens in the U.S. And like you said, I'm not in a loft, but I'm in an apartment building at the at the top floor. And so people are just walking behind me and I apologize for it. Um, so you, you said the word ADA. ADA is the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was put into law to to force people to provide the accessibility to people who are uh, handicapped. It's not just about people physically handicapped, it's also people that are mentally handicapped, right? Anybody who is a defined disability. Correct. There's, there's an act to, to allow them to function as, as close to equal, though that never really happens, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, the other thing, the other, yeah, the other thing you mentioned, which we, you, you skipped over quickly, but you said um, you had a partner that started the business for you because when you started to speak and get paid for speaking, um, you had to protect your disability payment. So I want to explain again, um, and you correct me. I know a little bit about this, but not as much as you. So when you're officially uh, labeled, diagnosed as disabled within the American system, then you're entitled to, I guess these are social security payments, right? The government then gives you, mm -hmm. right? Social security, so you get an uh, X amount of dollars towards your living expenses or whatever it is you need because they recognize you are not equal to a fully functioning person, so you need the help, right? So right. let's say they give you, and I, I forgot how they make up the number, but, uh, you know, let's say they give you nine hundred dollars a month, right? Which is which is a joke to begin with, right? But but here's the thing: the minute you start to earn money beyond a certain threshold, it's a, the, those payments can be taken away. Yeah. How, how much is it? One thousand four hundred and seventy dollars a month. So once you earn over that, the payments will be taken from you. But the the best part is how broken the system is. So I went back to work. Um, my dad got COVID late 2019 or 20, I'm sorry, 2021. Um, and he was hospitalized and I didn't know how we were going to live. And I applied for a home loan on my social security disability payment. And they said, you don't make enough. And I applied for an apartment and they're like, you don't make enough. You can't, no, you can't stay here. And so I had to go back to work full time and I was an orthodontic assistant. So I was the person that worked on teeth and changed colors and wires on braces to straighten teeth. And so I went back to work full time. And once that happens, like you get kicked off after a nine month trial work period. And so that nine month period came and went, but they continued to send me checks. And so I put them in my savings account. I knew they were going to come back for their money eventually. Yeah. I paid them. Um, so after six months, I paid the money back to them. <laughs> and they said, we're good to go. Everything's clear. And then a month later, somebody marked it that my check bounced, even though it cleared out, I was good to go. Um, so now I'm getting documentation from my bank, letters, certified letters that prove that the money was taken out of my bank account by Social Security. It's just been a complete nightmare. And that's the side of the system that no one really talks about because a lot of people get on the system and they stay there. That was never my goal. It was there to assist me while I figured out how to live independently. And there's still resources outside of this. Like when I quit working or when I started working, my biggest fear was losing medical insurance because I have medical supplies I need. So if I, if I don't have access to these supplies, I can't live life. And mm -hmm. there's stipulations, even if you, there's buy-in programs for government insurance. And even if you buy in, I still can't get married. I still can't have over $2,000 in my bank account even though I'm paying monthly for this. And it's like, those are the things I'm currently fighting for to get removed, is, is to get these limitations for the people that are contributing back to society removed so we can still have a little bit of this equal access. So uh, I'll make a statement. It's not political, but it's, it's, it's true. Uh, that is isn't that amazing that in this country, uh, wealthy people have every opportunity to write off everything under the sun and pay as low taxes or no taxes. But someone like you who gets a meager $1,400 assistance, the minute you, you cross the threshold of that money and doing it on your own, the money is taken away from you. And the fact that you continue to get checks, because I happen to know that process well, uh, somebody that I know very closely, um, 
the system is inefficiently bureaucratic uh, and, and filled with with public servant workers that just uh, underpaid and really don't give a crap. So you can continue to get payments, and then at some point the system discovers you, and then you have to give them back the money that they overpaid you, right? It's really insane. Okay, so let's go back to, let's stay, let's stay motivated and up and talk about <laughs> your first business, the first business you started. What was it? It was just a consulting business where I would do social media and help people grow their brand through social because I organically grew my following from 5,000 people in 2018 to the 110 pay on Instagram that's currently seen. Um, between Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook, I have over half a million followers. And so my thing is getting brand awareness. That was the big thing that I jumped into. I'm like, let's get your brand known. Let's get you growing on social. Let me teach you how to do it. And so I started there um, and speaking, but then it went into, I started learning about fitness and nutrition and I became a nutrition coach. Um, I got certified for nutrition and helping people learn how to use food and use food to reach their goals. Like weight loss is controlled by food. You don't have to go to the gym to lose weight. And I think that's the most important thing. It's like, it's not only about right now, it's about the longevity of our health, the longevity of our independence. And that's something that everyone needs, not just wheelchair users. Like if you want to hit, if you're 30 now and you want to be 60 and still have good health, what you do now is what's going to matter and impact you at 60. And that's something that we don't think about, we don't talk about as Americans a lot, is what we do now and how it impacts us 10, 20, 30 years from now. Yeah, because we have commercials for Big Mac and cheeseburgers. <laughs> and following the Big Mac commercial, their commercial for Ozempic, which is a way to lose weight and and diets none yeah you're right so um uh so how does someone clearly you're driven and motivated that's the understatement of the year but starting a business uh and, and learning how to grow it requires experience and skills so where did you draw that from or was just trial by error i'm going to be a consultant i'm going to learn I'm going to talk to people how to do this and eventually figure things out. I think the biggest tip I can give people, read 10 pages of a nonfiction personal development book every day. Because you can learn from other people's experience. And that's what allowed me to grow and develop. I want to say it was either Napoleon Hill or Dale Carnegie. It was one of the, one of the two authors that I read. And they said that they it was Napoleon Hill. He said that he has a group of people that he consults with, that he looks up to. Even though he may never meet them in real life, it's his people that he looks to. So for me, when it came to fitness, I look at Ashley Horner and Hannah Jones. I'm like, that's who I want to be when it comes to fitness. When I look at grit and, and mindset, I look at David Goggins. Like, I want to be the, the David Goggins of wheelchair users. I want to be that disciplined, that just driven. Um, when it came to business, I looked at Andy Frisella and um, Alex Hermosi. I'm like, these two people are my people. So when I'm consulting in life, I go to these people and I go consume their content and I listen to what they're saying because that's where I, that's who I want to be like in my business, in my own way. Right. So it's like, we, we have to be conscious about who we surround ourselves with. My parents in the beginning thought I was nuts. They didn't support me just the, the way it is for everyone. My friends also didn't understand why can't you come out? Why won't you hang out? Like some building something, you don't get it. And whereas now I'm five years into business and people's tone is changing a little bit. It looks a little different, you know? And I think that's the beauty of it. But you have to you have to detach from other people's opinions that you've respected your whole life and start listening to the opinions of the people that you want to emulate and be like to allow you to be able to get that mindset to reach that level. So there, I, I think there are a lot of coaches and consultants. I'm a, I'm a business coach, but I don't ever, I never call myself a consultant because my, I guess my my concept of consultant was what I was experienced uh, with in the corporate world. And to me, these were, you know, people that showed up with, you know, their their suit and their beautiful tie and shoes, <laughs> and they sat down and they did 
mostly name dropping of everybody they knew in the industry. Um, and then they offered the services because I know everybody and I've done this and I've done that. But at the end of the day, and again, I'm not knocking consultants because I'm not generalizing, but at least quite a few of them just turned out to be just lazy. They just, they just spun off their book of connection. They had templated things that they had prepared. And so they would spend time talking to us and at the end, give us a nice little binder with probably changed the company names and made some adjustments and here you go there's there's my report to i i to me a coach is not a consultant a, a coach is somebody that sticks with you and guides you and walks you through the process and somebody that you can talk to and engage with not somebody that just does something for a fee and and whatever i mean the binder could be filled with great things but then you're still left with the need to execute what's in there that you should be doing, right? That's what coaches do. Um, what was the, if you look back at coaching and motivational speaking, and now you're, you're a nutritionist and you got certified, um, creating an app to help wheelchair inbound people stay fit and get motivated. What's the, what's one mistake you made that, that resonated with you that's the way you said, Oh, wow, I can't do that. Oh, I got to learn from time management. Time management's a big thing. When you're an entrepreneur and you have no schedule, you need to create a schedule. You need a calendar. Like calendar blocking was the big turn for me. When I actually started blocking my time, this is what I'm doing at this time and sticking to it like it's a job because it is a job. Um, I think the biggest the biggest barrier to anything in life is lack of action uh, and, and lack of, of just taking that first step. And so we have to, we have to let go of fear and, and manage our time a little better. It's like, oh crap, it's six o'clock, where'd the day go? Whereas like when you calendar block, you're like, oh, this is where the day went. And you see tangible things that you've completed to allow you to get the result that you're after. Well, Jesse just froze. We'll wait for her to come back. Oh, oh no. Okay, I tell you back. Perfect. <laughs> the, the internet signal goes on and off, but it's fine. Um, yeah. So time management and and probably the other thing I would add, and you can tell me if if it applies to you, is um, be careful what you say yes to, and don't be afraid to say no, right? Because that's how your calendar gets out the just get thrown out the window. It's very, there are a lot of tempting uh, things that come our way, especially if someone like you, if you have half a million followers, I'm sure that people are pitching you all day long with all kinds of things, right? But you gotta stay, you gotta stay in your lane and focus on what you're good at and not get tempted by things that distract you. Well, before you say yes to anything, I always think about, is this serving where I wanna be? And if it is not serving where I'm trying to go, then I do say no. I'm like, I'm sorry. Whereas, for example, um, there's someone that I coach that's doing like a dance event at UNC and like to go support her, to go spend two hours of my time supporting somebody because I want to see them be successful, right? That's so different than being like, hey, let's go out to dinner this night. And it's like, well, how is this going to serve me? Is it serving me mentally, emotionally, physically? And if it's not, then I kindly decline. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I just, I can't right now. And I say no, I learned how to say no, because if you say yes, your schedule gets overbooked. You get, you get spiral out of control where you're like, I'm doing too much. I can't handle any of this. So um, I, I, again, I don't like cliches, but I'm gonna use it because the first thing came to my mind. What keeps you up at night? What are you worried about? I mean, you, you're, you're doing great. Um, you are your biggest proponent, right? No one else is going to do that for you. But we're all human, right? When you, when you lay down, what, what are you worried about? What's, what scares the crap out of you? The state of the world and the state of this country right now. Not to talk mm -hmm. politics, but 100% the state of the world. Because as an entrepreneur, we don't go do a nine to five for somebody else. Um, I believe what I do is needed, but not everyone views it that way, right? And so it's like, what's the future of my business look like if 
we do end up being a communist country if things continue going the way it goes, right? And those those are things I, I think about often because you watch things. <laughs> Living on government assistance changed my whole perspective. <laughs> you see how the system's truly set up to have control. You see how people literally have to crawl from poverty to be able to create wealth, financial wealth, um, emotional wealth, mental wealth, right? Like those things are all created. They're not things that are just automatically given to us. And the barriers now are hard enough. I'm not saying that would be impossible if like say the country got worse, but it does make it harder. It makes it more challenging. And I enjoy being free. And I enjoy being free to do what I want to do. But it's like the amount we're taxed. I think that that's obnoxious too. <laughs> so for me, it's the state of the world. That's that's the biggest thing that keeps me up. I've, I've, I don't, I don't really think about my disability as a limitation. It's my superpower. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think that that the biggest thing I want people to take away from this us talking is the way they view people with disabilities. Give us a chance. Whether you own an organization, we. We have a very different mindset because we have to do things in steps and we're very methodical. And I think the biggest thing my disability gave me is like, if I know that from the basement to upstairs, I need to grab four or five things, I'm going to go in the order it is to get me outside. I'm not going to keep running back and forth. Whereas non-disabled people, they waste a lot of time running back and forth because they can do it. And I'm like, you just thought a little more methodically. (laughs) <laughs> you wouldn't be losing so much time. And so I think that my disability is my superpower. And the other thing, I guess the other thing that keeps me up at night is how can I create equal access to give people with disabilities confidence to go out and live life, to get off the system, to stop living in poverty. Because living on the system is living in poverty. Plain and simple. There's too many limitations to keep you right here under control and you need to get beyond that because you're worth more than that, disabled or not. And and to the non-disabled community, accept us as human beings. Don't treat us different because we use a mobility device. Talk to us like we're a human being because we are a human being. If I didn't speak and say that I was in a wheelchair, you would never know from listening to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> You're back. Just <laughs> okay. You're back. Yeah. You know the the other thing is I mean you're saying so many so many things that are profound about uh, the state of our country, but uh, again, someone that comes from a smaller country with not as many conveniences back then, you know, life in the U.S. is about conveniences, is about luxuries, about you know, saving for a house and then buying the car and then buying a new car and then redoing the kitchen and redoing the bathroom and going on vacation. And and very often uh, being associated with somebody with disability uh, creates this, this crazy notion of a reflection of, well, I don't know if I should be seen. It's like, it, it you know what I mean? I'm sure you've experienced it. Um, and we, we really have to go beyond it. Even if hiring somebody to work in an office who is fully, really capable. But I would hire you in an instant as my marketing director for social media, right? Because you've done it. You've done it on your own. You've built it. Granted, not everybody has the type of story that you have, which is an advantage, but you still have to do the work to get the story out there and to get people and build a tribe for yourself And beyond just building a trial for yourself, it takes a lot of work to get people engaged. It's not like people follow you and then you're done, right? It's not going to do you anything. So, um, which is, which reminds me of somebody that, that that I was working with and they were phenomenally successful nutritional drink company that got there because the founder knew a bunch of rock and roll guys, very famous people. So when, when they created that drink, Everybody posted on social media and they immediately got to a million followers on Facebook, right? Uh, which is which is great. And then we sat down one day and one of his partners said, you need, they need some help. So we sat down and talked. And I said, um, how many active customers do you have? And he looked around and he said, um, 
I don't know, three, four thousand. And I look and I said, dude, you have a million Facebook followers. How is that possible? Right? Not to say that every Facebook follower needs to buy from you, but something just didn't connect, right? If you have that many people following you and you have a smaller amount of people who are actively believe in you and buy your product, there is a huge disconnect. And the disconnect wasn't the marketing because these guys were over the top, obnoxious marketing people like promotion and discounts all day long, which was a big mistake. It, it, it was really more about, there was no emotional connection with the product itself, right? Everybody has nutrition and shake. Everybody's got some post-workout, blah, blah, blah. That's not what it's about. Uh, and it was interesting that the owner had a very, very impactful personal story of how he got to develop that shake. And I don't want to talk more about it because I'm going to wind up revealing who they are. And they just never spoke about it. It was literally a life changing uh, event in their life that got them to search for something nutritious, organic, that will make an impact on your body and your immune system. That was nowhere to be found, right? So uh, back to, to my point, I would hire you instantly as a social media director for my company. And let's say we worked in an office and it wasn't wheelchair friendly, right? You know what the conversation would be around the conference table. Oh, she's amazing, but you know, we don't have this thing. How is she gonna get in and out? And how is she gonna maneuver around the cubicles? And how is she gonna do this? And, and I would say, well, we'll make it happen, okay? Just make it happen. That's not a conversation. Right. I actually would rather have a wheelchair person like you work for me <laughs> than a regular person who one that's going to get a better offer and is going to walk their ass right out the door. You're not going to do that so quickly if it's an environment that's fulfilling for you and allows you to grow and you feel equal. Right. Well, that's that's, that's what happened whenever I applied to go back to work. Right. I sent five applications out. Um, three of them I never heard back from. Uh, one of them, I had an interview and she's like, you know, you're just not fit for our office. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. And then the other one gave me a working interview, ended up hiring me. And within three months I was the, the clinic manager. And so it was like, it just takes one person giving you an opportunity. And like when the, when the wheelchair came up, she's like, how are you going to maneuver us? I said, I don't know, but we'll figure it out. We figure it out all the time. Like that is life because the the country is not accessible. My disability comes up. I am very, very good at figuring it out because there, there's no other choice. Either I figure it out or I don't get to live. And so I think that is the beauty of having a person with a disability in your workspace is we'll figure it out. We always do because we've never had a choice not to be able to figure it out. So whether it's work related or personal life related, we will find a solution. So, you know, when, when I was interviewing a corporate world for people and we sat, I sat in a conference room with a candidate, um, it was just me and the candidate. And the first thing they say, because that's how people train them to do is they come in with a manila folder and they say, oh, by the way, do you need a copy of my resume? And I said, no. I said, oh, we're not going to talk. No, we're not going to talk about your resume. Your resume, I read it. That's why you're here. I'm here to get to know you as a person. And, and the concept of my conversation with a person, as I always explain to people, is that if you have a, a gas stove in your house apartment and you looked under the, the, if you lift it up or you actually peek, there's always a tiny little pilot light that's running, right? So that when you turn the gas, that's what starts to flame on each, on each unit. Um, so the purpose of me interviewing somebody and not talking about the resume I was looking for someone that had a pilot light in terms of aspirations and motivation, something that I could, with my skills and the team, take that pilot light and turn it into a flame at some point. But if the pilot light doesn't exist, then, and it's obvious when you talk to somebody that it's either there or it's not there, right? Mm -hmm. By the way, it's not something that you learn. For me, I, that's my opinion. After hiring many, many people and working, coaching people, you either have it or you don't. I, you don't. This is not an implantable pilot light, you, right? So you're either a loser or you're somebody who wants to be something. So um, my point is, 
the, the great majority of people that I hired in my career were single moms. And I remember my employer was said to me, uh, and by the way, that we could ask them what they do back then. Today you can't. Uh, but anyway, um, so why are you hiring her? She's got kids and she doesn't have a husband and the kids are going to get sick and she's going to have to take days off from work. And I'd say, there's no, first of all, it's a mother, which we don't understand is the power of motherhood is there. Secondly, there's no greater motivation for a single mom who is supporting her family and her children. I, I, I don't have to teach her anything. That pilot light is huge. It's already there, right? So I, I think the same applies to people like you. Somebody, if you hire somebody with a disability and, they, and they're sitting in front of you, meaning, meaning that they actually have the internal motivation to not allow their disability to, to control them, right? Um, what else do you want? To show them how to do their job. They'll take, or, take care of the rest. Exactly. <laughs> I agree with that. So, so um, I, I want to get to a couple rapid fire questions, Jess, if it's okay. Okay. Um, who is who is the one person that influenced your life personally? My mom, for sure. Uh, my mom is one of the hardest working people I know. Uh, her, I'm, I'm very grateful I got her work ethic in my team. <laughs> right. What about what about in business? One person that left the name. Who? Andy Priscilla, for sure. Okay. He's, um, he's the owner of First Form, which is a supplement company out of St. Louis. In in looking at your, we'll call it entrepreneurial journey, everything you've done from motivational speaking to supplement to becoming a nutrition coach, uh, to doing the app for wheelchair and bar people, what's what's one lesson you learn out of all of that that you can share with people who are either entrepreneurs or considering it? The, the biggest lesson is letting go of judgments of who you think you should be, where you think you should be, um, letting go of those judgments that others hold over you. When, when we let go of judgments and opinions and just start head down, eyes up, doing the work, it, it's a game changer. And just do the damn work. Like, it's not going to be easy. It's not easy for anyone. And the people that you see succeeding, they have a very similar journey to what you're going through right now. And, and just know that they, they reach that success because of the work they put in. And if they didn't put work in to get that success, that success won't be long-term, won't be a long-term success. So keep that in mind too. If you, if you see someone that got it super fast, very, very likely they're not going to keep it. Whereas when people do the work, it's the hard things. The more hard things you do, the easier it is to build that grit and determination for when business comes and slaps you in the face. And, and, you know, that's a great point because, you know, people tend to get imprinted on these mega celebrity success people. Uh, for example, Gary Vaynerchuk, right? Oh, Gary, Gary, Gary. But if you actually listen to his story, it, it, he didn't become Gary V by deciding to be Gary V. He worked in his dad's liquor store. He was hustling. He was hustling. He worked his ass off to get to where he was. Um, John Lee Dumas, who is the entrepreneur on fire guy on, I guess, then still the number one entrepreneur podcast, listen to his stories. It took him 10 years to get to where he is. So you're right. It just, just do the damn work and stop trying to copy people who are successful because they didn't get there, but just, yeah. Okay. So, uh, Guy Raz, who is, who's got a, a podcast I've been listening to for years, right? The, how I built it on NPR. He always ends his podcast uh, interviews asking their guests, and I can ask you the question, but I know what the answer would be. Do you think it was hard work or luck that got you to where you are today? Hard work. Yeah, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, for you, but that's but look, there we can debate if luck exists and what does that mean? Are people are are lucky or not? Um, I don't know what the answer is. You know, some people, you, 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 you meet somebody and they'll say, you know, everything they touch turns to gold. Uh, not really. It's, it's about th they've learned enough in their life to be able to sidestep the mistakes that other people do and turn things into gold because they're learned from, from failure. 
Yeah. That's that's right? that luck is the result of hard work. That that's it. I mean, I, I believe that full heartedly. The more that you work on yourself physically, mentally, emotionally, we have to work on self. The more powerful and the more understanding you have of yourself, the the more easy it is to maneuver in the world, especially in the entrepreneur space, but just in general, it's it's easier. You have a different view. You the less likely you are to fall into the victimhood of your struggle. Yeah, and the the only thing about luck that I I personally believe in it, it's not higher being and it's not you know born with it. Uh, more often than not, it's just timing, right? You just happen to be at the right time when at the right place. Uh, how did you get there? Okay, <laughs> maybe it's luck, maybe it's not. We can debate that, but it it you have to do the work in order to to be able to benefit from that intersection in life where the timing is right and you get the, the shot of your life. It doesn't have to be big, it could be something small. All right, last question. Uh, I happen to be in New York City. Um, can't see all the buildings behind me, but if I gave you a billboard in Times Square and I said, Jesse, put whatever you want on it, millions of people are gonna see it every day. What would you put on it? You are the creator of your own reality with a logo of the Wheel With Me Adapt Fit app. It's a wheelchair user in motion, and it's like a heavier wheelchair user. Um, and then a picture of my business partner and I looking strong as heck in our wheelchairs as the background with that text over it, kind of like a Nike billboard with like how it has like the shadow and the text, same idea, but you're the creator of your own reality. And I think that is the most important people, most important thing people realize. Cause it took me getting paralyzed to realize that, that I'm responsible for the life I'm living. And with that, <laughs> and that's true. And by the way, it's true for the life you live and it's true for the business you build. You are responsible for it. Uh, if you're the owner of a company, you surround yourself with smart, capable people, and then you allow them to do what they were hired for, then you're okay. If it doesn't work, then as Zig Ziglar used to say, when you point one finger at someone, there's three fingers pointing right back at you. So that's a, that's a great lesson. Jesse, um, you're amazing. We will definitely stay in touch. Uh, I will share all your contact info um, in the show notes, both on YouTube and on the audio podcast. Uh, if they want to find you, how do you spell your last name? It's Jesse. <laughs> um, so it's J E S I, which is my full name. And then my last name is S T R A. C H A M looks like Stratum, pronounced Strawham. <laughs> hmm. Okay, so the C is silent. <laughs> yeah, Polish. You know, you know how we are. <laughs> what? Are you, oh, what? You're Polish? What'd you say? Yeah, my dad. My dad's 100 percent Polish. My great grandparents came oh. over on the boat, and um, they're Polish immigrants. Look at you. I'm 100 percent Polish. <laughs> my my parents who immigrated to 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 Israel and. Uh, just spoke to my cousin Israel after the, the atrocities that are going on there. And um, there's actually a way for us to get a Polish passport if we if we can prove that our parents were Polish. Uh, wow. It's pretty amazing. You know, you yeah. can actually and then you get an EU passport and you can wheel your way all through Europe without any restrictions. I love it. And work for and work for free. Anyway, <laughs> not send you anywhere. We need you here. That's fine. <clears throat> Jesse, thank you so much. Sorry for the interruptions since I'm not at, in my typical office, but uh, this was great. I appreciate your time. We will great. stay in touch. Thank you for having me, Zev. And to the audience, you know, if you gain benefit from this podcast, if there's something that you're like, wow, someone else could take something from this, share it with a friend. That's how podcasts grow is through sharing. And so please share this with somebody that could also benefit from today's message. See, my thing about my podcast is I never self-promote, so you did it for me. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I'll, I owe you a nutritious dinner at some point when I see you. I'm ready. All right. Thanks. Thank you.